<laughs> Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is um, looking May 22nd, uh, 2013. And Chris Sloan had a really cool idea, and uh, he invited um, James Paul G to come talk to us um, on June 5th. I think that's correct. Right. Yeah. In a couple of weeks. And I said, that'd be great, but why don't we talk about the book, um, the book called um, The <laughs> Anti-Education Anti -education Era. Era, yeah. And, and some people have said that subtitle is even more interesting. What is the subtitle again? It's uh, Creating Smarter Students Through Digital Learning. There we go. So, we, so instead of just waiting for him, we thought we would get started with a conversation about the book. And uh, we found some folks who like the book, uh, interested in the book, people we don't necessarily know, and Chris found some colleagues. But Chris, do you want to explain where you came upon the book, and then we'll do quick introductions around the horn here. Sure. And, just, uh, and I, by the way, um, this is a total, just, uh, many of you are very new to teachers, teaching teachers. If you don't know, we're... Um, just a conversation, so please interrupt. Please just jump in whenever you'd like. But go ahead, Chris. Okay, well, I uh, heard of the book through Lee, actually, uh, because um, I'm helping teach at Michigan State um, this summer um, in the overseas cohort, and the reading for the first year group is the anti-education era. And so, um, you know, the more I read the book, um, uh, the more intrigued I became with the book because, you know, it's really not like a lot of education books that I've read uh, in a number of ways. Um, and so then I thought, well, it'd be really nice to talk to James about this. And so I shot him an email and he said, fine, let's do it um, June 5th. And uh, so the whole thing came about because of Lee, actually. And so... Um, well, maybe Chris, Lee, do you want to say a little... Introduce oh. yourself a little bit more. Sure. And Lee, yeah. Jump in. Well, my name is Chris Sloan, and I teach high school English and media in, at Judge Memorial in Salt Lake City, Utah. And my colleague is Lee Graves Wolf, who will now introduce herself. Hi, Lee. Welcome to Teachers and Teaching Teachers. Teaching Teachers. Oh, you got to unmute, Lee. Lee, you got to unmute. <laughs> I got it. There you go. Good. That's better. Perfect. I figured out the lower thirds. I have to, you know, the microphone is the next <laughs> step. Um, I direct the Master of Arts in Educational Technology program at Michigan State University. And this is actually my second teacher teaching teachers. I was on, it was a while back, and I don't remember what the episode was, but it's great <laughs> to be back here again. And um, so our program has several different formats. One uh, that Chris had mentioned is overseas this summer, which Marcy is a part of, who's down there in our um, Google Hangout. And um, what we try to do with each set of our courses is, is ground uh, our discussions in, in a book for the year. We found this to be quite effective. Being a master's in ed tech, um, one of the things for a while that we prided ourselves on is that everything is online, all the materials are free, you can pull this stuff together, and we've sort of moved towards reading very contemporary, relevant, inexpensive books for our students so we can sort of expand our conversations and, and ground them and connect them to our um, to our curriculum. So the anti-education era um, was brought to my attention by Michelle Shara Hagerman, who is a colleague of mine at Michigan State, and we just completely renovated our online portion of this course as well, um, based upon the G book. So, um, and I can post some links um, to some of the work that our students have already started doing around this, but we're really having them deeply integrate this into um, a course, uh, and I, I can't remember the name of the course, but essentially it's problems of practice with technology. So they're looking at wicked problems and using G's lens and, and sort of digging into this discussion. So as we chat tonight as well, and for those of you that have, have read this, I would um, love to, to discuss and think about ways that we can sort of further our own students thinking and engagement with this book as well 
um, for their sort of curricular and, and teaching lenses. So we're, we're specifically using it with, with um, classroom teachers. Very cool. Jerry, why don't you go next, if you don't mind. All right. My, <clears throat> excuse me. My name is Jerry James, and uh, I'm from the, the website edreach.us. Um, I do a podcast with a co-host, Zach Gilbert. The podcast is called Ed Gamer. Uh, we are focusing on games and learning and trying to bring some more of that, um, you know, that type of learning to, to light. Uh, we've had Jim on a couple times. He's a fantastic fantastic person um, and and always entertaining and uh, I'll try not to spoil any of the any of the, the awesome stuff that he has to say for your for your for your upcoming show but uh, he, he's done he's done some great research and obviously with it being games based uh, we use quite a bit of his his insight in our podcast and uh, we just actually talked to him a, a few weeks ago and it's fantastic to, to hear from him again so uh, I do love the book I've been going through it so very cool. You're, you're a high school teacher? I am, so, sorry. I'm a visual arts teacher, yeah, in the high school age. Cool. And just going across here, um, Marcy, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi. Um, my name is Marcy Lewis, and I teach grade four at Ridley College, which is in St. Catharines, Ontario. And I'm just kind of lurking, um, kind of looking at what I'm going to be digging into this summer in the Mayette program. and getting my feet a little wet before I get my copy of the book. I would say you're in the pool. You're not lurking. At this <laughs> <You're> welcome. <laughs> you're swimming with the sharks. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you for coming on. Um, Pete, do you want to introduce yourself? Welcome. Can you hear me okay now? Perfect, yep. Okay, cool. Um, my machine is sometimes the thing that causes the echo, um, and so I, I was muting myself there for a little bit. Um, my name is Pete Rohrbaugh. I'm a um, um, visiting lecturer at Georgia State University in the English department, um, but finishing out my last year there and moving on to um, Southern Polytechnic State University, which is just a little ways up the road, and have worked a lot in um, new media literacy um, and my master's degree, my PhD is in American literature but my master's degree is in English. Um, so I've been studying um, critical pedagogy and digital pedagogy kind of stranded together for a couple of years now and mm -hmm. in addition to a bunch of other colleagues and Roger um, is also one of these, I'm the, um, I founded in, um, and I'm the associate editor of Hybrid Pedagogy, which is an online journal for teaching and technology. Um, hybridpedagogy.com is our URL. Very cool. And your association with the book? Um, <laughs> Roger, somehow you guys connected with Roger. I, he and I tried to work this out on the phone last night. Somehow you guys connected to Roger. I think, I think it might have been through Goodreads, by the way. Yeah, 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 right. So then he put my name and a couple of our other partners' names and Kathy Davidson's name into the Google Hangout um, window. And, I mean, it's not like I don't have 15 other things to do, but when I saw the name of the book, I was like, I hadn't heard of the book at all, so I thought... I'd really like to check that out. It sounds interesting. And they had it at Barnes and Noble, so I drove out last night and bought it and spent last <laughs> night and today skimming it. Um, so yeah, I'm interested to talk about it. Great place to start. Cool. Roger. Thank you for joining us. Introduce yourself if you would. And then we'll get started. A little more. Hey, I'm I'm Roger Whitson. I'm an assistant professor of English. Um, at Washington State University, um, and I also teach in the Digital Technology and Culture program there. Um, oh, great. Um, and uh, I, I guess I read this book back in February, so my memory of it's, it is kind of hazy in some ways. <laughs> that fast? Um, Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just... yeah, I, yeah, I know. I, I have horrible memory. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm the problem that he's identifying. <laughs> 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 um, 
But, you know, I and generally speaking, um, my interests lie in, um, you know, my field is English um, literary studies, and there are a lot of really interesting challenges that digital technology is, is laying down for my field um, in terms of, you know, I, I, I can have some, there are a lot of things that G talks about in, in the um, book, such as students who don't really know why they're there that I can have I have a very personal experience with so there are a lot of things in the book um, that uh, I really identified with and and thought that he um, identified pretty well um, there are other places where I'm I, I don't agree with everything he says but um, I found it to be a pretty compelling text so cool. Yep. Well, thank you all for joining us. And and we're and I I'm a teacher in the Bronx. I teach at Bronx Academy, um, senior high, and um, work with the New York City Writing Project. Um, and I've been you know reading. I've, I'm up to chapter four, I think. So I'm, I'm we're all in sort of a different place um, as we go here. And, and I think that's cool. We can kind of figure out. Um, where we are and what we want to talk about a little bit. Um, as I was going around looking for people, and I'm, I'm coming back to you, Lee, on this question, um, somebody said, I, I just read, um, somebody on, I don't even remember who this was, but I just read the first two chapters and I just changed everything in my research. Um, so I'm wondering why, and Lee, you said you just changed everything in something, in some program, because of the book. I'm wondering if we could kind of start with that question. Like, why is this sort of making people change what they do? Is that too big a question? But you no, got, yeah. no, I, I think, you know, speaking through, through our own lens, especially mm -hmm. being an ed tech program, we're always, we're always changing and refreshing curriculum. And, and something about um, this, I, I think the way the book was written, and I guess if I want to make a comparison to the, um, to sort of the shift that it, it, it gives people initially when you first start mm -hmm. reading it. And for those of you that have finished, and I've had conversations with people that have finished as well, the first part of the book is very different from the second part. There's, especially reading from a, a, the teacher lens, some of my colleagues that I was reading this with were very anxious in the first half, but then felt like relieved, I think, as they they got along the book in terms of him offering solutions and things like that. But um, I, I think that, um, to me, if we can make an analogy to the, the Larry Cuban undersold and overused mm -hmm. book, I think it will sort of, it, it will create conversations, important conversations that need to happen um, and give us a basis for those. And I think it, it gave us a really nice um, platform to start discussing in a, a deeper way that we've been grasping for when we're talking about integrating educational technologies and things like that, um, gave us venues um, from his, his very unique way of discussing and very upfront. I, I read some criticism that um, the book was, um, I think this was on Goodreads as well, someone had said it, it feels like it's just mimicking or we, we've heard this all before. And maybe some of us have, but I think it's it's in such an accessible way for those that aren't entrenched in the literature research side of it that it's a really nice op door opening uh, for that. So for, from our perspective, I think that's where we, we gravitated towards this um, as a, a shift in our our um, our conversation and grounding it here, and then we can pull in all the technologies and social media and things like that um, through this book for for conversation. Does that make sense? Yeah, and, and I would add that, um, you know, the first half of the book, the more you read it, you know, it's chapter after chapter of, why, you know, why we're stupid. And, um, and you know, um, I'm used to teacher books where they kind of cut to the chase as like, and here's what you need to do to save your teaching, you know. Have them do blogs or, you know, those kinds of things. And, um, you know, he really lays out um, a lot of problems up front and those are things that I think we all know as educators are there but some of them are so big you know like uh, the disparity income disparity in our nation right now that you know I, I hope we kinda get to it and a little bit later but you know what does a educator do 
about these issues. But you know, the first half of the book with the problems was, um, you know, it took me a while to uh, really get into it because I did feel like you know I see these problems a lot. But the second half really is, um, you know, optimistic and hopeful and um, really has some provocative ideas. I think Paul for us, like with youth voices, um, that has a lot of applications too. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who don't know, Youth Voices is a social network that students are on. Um, and Chris and I kind of started that oh, a while ago, 2003, and have been developing it since. Um, but so, yeah, it's a digital learning platform is one way to think about it. <laughs> but yeah. Other thoughts? This is, yeah, this is sort of a the, the, the fascinating conversation for me just because of the different spaces in, in which we exist. I think maybe mm -hmm. Lee, Lee's uh, comment about reading on Goodreads about, you know, we've seen this all before, might have been my review, I'm not sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but, like, you know, it's, it is interesting because um, I can empathize with a lot, of the, a lot of the issues that he lays out in the first part of, of, the, um, of the book. Um, and yet, you know, when I when I talk to my colleagues about it, you know, uh, they have they have some some of the same responses. Like, you know, oh, he's talking about um, the banking concept of education. You know, Paulo Ferreira outlined in the 1970s. You know, um, so it, it's it's interesting to sort of see like when 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 you guys are talking about you know, it's changing the conversation. Um, the one question that I would have is like, well, who's who's having this conversation, and to what end, and and is there a way we can sort of maybe cross the the boundaries that I see happening between maybe higher education and secondary and you know public education and stuff like that. I don't know. Those are just some thoughts. That's helpful. Given who's uh, down here tonight, that's really a good. Point, um, and and I was thinking about audience. Uh, is, I mean, the the book doesn't seem to be written for a research community or university. It seems like a pretty, um, you know, common reader that it's written for. Okay? Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I had some ideas on that. Um, it seemed um, to kind of piggyback on some things that Roger has said, and and, and this probably isn't a great. Um, like it's 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 not fair, but Roger and I have been like in this community of people since we worked together two or three years ago, and we've all kind of been reading some of the same books. Um, so, in one sense, I do I did feel like um, I did feel like I'd heard some of this before, and that I'd heard some of it better um, in the Kathy Davidson book, which is called um, Now You See It. Uh, Roger, mm -hmm. you recommended that to me a long time ago, um, and um, I—it's it, really, really weird. I don't do this very often, but as I was reading the book, I kept thinking, "I wonder if he's going to bring up X, or I wonder if he's going to bring up Y." And I would run back to the um, index at the back, and I would look for, you know, is he going to bring up Freire? Is he going to bring up? Um, Ryan Gold, is he going to bring up, how many times is he going to mention Twitter? How many, you know, like I was looking for, I was looking for like what I could expect that was coming. And, um, and when I wouldn't find stuff in the index that I, that I was expecting would be coming, I was like, wow, how, how, how are these things not like where, where, where this narrative is headed? Um, and I do think, I do agree with you that he, um, that it's not, it's not for a particularly research-oriented audience that he's writing the book. He's writing the book for Americans who are interested in progressive education in, in some kind of, you know, like, round and, um, I don't know, like, amorphous way. I, I don't know. That's a long answer to the question, but I, I, did, um, I did feel like I had to figure out what the audience was too while I was reading it. I think I think part of that is the way that Jim writes. He talks he talked a lot on our podcast about um, 
constantly knowing something. You know, the, the difference between when, when you research something in, into such depth that it starts to become gray to you. Uh, he, he said it's fantastic when something is very black and white to you because you get to make really rash judgments that sometimes are even wrong uh, just, just to put points out there and to start discussions. And to me, that's where this book comes from. He's so knowledgeable on, on the area of digital literacy and gaming and learning, and he studied that for so many years that he became in such a gray area with that, you know, where you can talk yourself in or out of anything you come up with. And uh, I think this was a new avenue for him um, where, where he, he starts to go back to black and white of what's right and what's wrong in our educational system. So I, I could see how you would, you know, make that inference from somebody who wrote so very compassionately about one small area to bringing it back to this larger scope. And, and I think that might have been intentional a little bit on his part as he starts a new vein in his writing and his, his career. I think I, I'm glad you brought up the American point of view point. It's something that I had not thought of. I mean it's obviously once you say that that's black and white to me and the context in which Chris and I are going to be teaching this, su this summer is an international context and a lot of times the conversations mm. that we'll have um, some of the, the pushback or the frustration from our students who teach in international schools that are not governed by the United States, um, they, they pick that up right away. So it'll be interesting this summer, Chris, to see um, the reactions from our other populations of students who are reading it with a different lens and how it sits with them. Because um, he does get political in a lot of these areas too, and, and those, those politics aren't necessarily what our our own audience are going to be confronted with either. So that's that'll be something interesting for us to think through. Yeah, and I think his um, his bit about affinity spaces later in the book. Um, I mean, it does speak to higher education and um, you know some of the issues there. He has this um, you know pretty utopian view. I like it of um, you know. <laughs> Universities as kind of like uh, places that foster these informal affinity spaces um, in, instead of what they are, and and I guess I'm curious because I teach high school. Um, I'm curious for the university folks here um, if you've read it. You know, what do you think of his uh, his vision of kind of where colleges should be? Um, because he mentions a lot about there's this whole chapter, and he mentions it again about how institutions are frozen thought um, that you know we you develop these things and they perpetuate themselves and it's not so easy to just come in and change those things do those resonate with you or have you heard all those things before too uh, I would say yes and yes I mean it's sort of um, it's been my experience that it's I actually started as a um, professor here at Washington State this um, this past year and, you know, there are a lot of interests in different spaces in the university system that keep very basic things from happening. Um, and so there's something about the way that the university is structured and the way that power is distributed in the university that makes uh, the kinds of changes that he's talking about, I would say, impossible to happen in, with the speed that maybe they need to happen. So um, I, I completely agree with what he says about how the university should be an affinity space, how we need to stop thinking in terms of narrow specialization, you know, all of this stuff. Um, in fact, you know, bringing up Kathy Davidson again, you know, one of the things in her book that I find very compelling is that she says, you know, our educational system is designed for a 19th century industrial workplace. Like, that's kind of what we want to create, right? Um, but that's not the world that we live in anymore. And um, our our universities need to need to change. But um, there are so many there are so many levels of, of of different kinds of power structures that are involved in that. Um, that politically, it seems very difficult to see how that would happen quickly, at least. Just to be fair, I mean, one of the things I love about Kathy's book is that it's not just schools that get criticized for that. You know, it's also workspaces <laughs> that get analyzed um, from that perspective of, you know, are they 
up to what needs to happen in workspaces too. But um, I, well, at some point, given I think given who's here, I'm not so sure. But um, I'd be curious to know about the the discipline of English and um, what impact digital learning has on that in, in terms of affinity spaces. Like, has English changed? And does G talk about that in the book um, in relation to this? Does that is that too does that make sense, that question? <laughs> like, like when I talk to colleagues who are still kind of literature based, I don't and I, I don't I don't know I don't feel like I'm talking to the same people as I am when I'm talking about um, you know digital learning and, and, and so forth um, yeah there's a um, I don't know if you can um, I keep worrying that my microphone is going to be giving everybody when, echoes so if you can. when you're talking it's fine and when okay. you're not I'll mute you okay <laughs> Go ahead. Um, in our department that that difference is um, is pretty stark between people who have a literature um, specialty and people who have a rhetoric and composition specialization um, because the red comp folks are just way more interested in kind of like this broad peripheral bunch of things like um, like pedagogy and um, institutional power and um, things like that and, and literature people are just by nature more conservative um, conservative in the way that G you know like lays out the variables conservative um, and I agree with you um, that that it seems like people who teach more literature based classes um, are less prone to be interested in digital teaching um, methodologies or hybrid learning or whatever um, and although I mean not exclusive like not completely but there 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 are fewer of them who are interested in doing that and I I don't I don't know I mean once you start thinking about digital skills and dominoing that down to things like collaboration and things that don't necessarily have to have anything to do with with um, with digital tools but collaboration and knowledge sharing and the capital M mind thing and um, and all of that stuff um, you, you you are in a certain sense in English like you you're, you're right there and you're in English in the way that English is kind of the hub of of thinking you know um, except that that is a rhetoric and composition at least in the in the in the environments that I've been in that's kind of an exclusively rhetoric and composition orientation and literature people are more like um, you know no like our field is more you know it's way more narrow than that yeah and, and I guess I would add um, you know Paul you said something a little bit about uh, has English changed or is it changing uh, the teaching of it and and I would say the some interesting stuff for me in the book is how he um, discusses the role of the individual in networked spaces. Uh, you know, as a writing teacher and and someone who you know tries to get their students to communicate well in online discussion forums, um, it's different in that respect. I think for decades I taught writing kind of as an individual thing. I mean, we all knew there was an audience, and you you have to adapt to an audience. But I think his um, his kind of thinking about the way knowledge is constructed in these networked spaces um, to me as an English teacher seems different than the old uh, you know rhetorical triangle um, and so in that sense I guess the social um, part of composition and knowledge construction seems different to me I just want to sort of add a little bit because um, one of the difficulties I think a lot of English people have with digital teaching is that you know our discipline is print oriented on some level on some fundamental level like we teach literature right literary studies right um, and so it's you know in some ways like I think for some for, for some teachers it's hard to get their head wrapped around okay so what do I do now is it still about reading is it still about you know talking about books or is it something else and 
Um, but there are also some really cool things that you can do with it. I, I actually uh, taught a course last last fall on uh, different types of, of, of reading that occurred in the 19th century. And one of the things that a lot of students today don't realize is that, you know, the notion of somebody sitting by themselves and reading silently is a very, you know, recent development. Like in the 19th century, when you read, sometimes you would, you know, stay up with your family and read to them out loud. Um, and, would, you know, nobody had television, so that's what you did that evening. Um, and you can sort of replicate some of those experiences using digital technology. Um, and so I think, I think there are a lot of really cool opportunities. I just feel that a lot of people in English can't, it's hard to get over that kind of hump of, you know, traditionally I, I teach stuff having to do with paper, having to do with books, and right now I don't know what to, I don't know where to go with that, you know, so. I would agree with that that point. I definitely think that you know, seeing it from a from a secondary standpoint, where uh, I think our curriculum at that level is largely anchored to text, paper text, and uh, there's just a general fear that when we get away from those things, <laughs> you know, into the great wide open, who knows what'll happen? And it scares people sometimes, but. You know, I think the book deals with that and talks about, there was a section of the book and I highlighted it and I was trying to find it, like, I can't, where he talks about, um, you know, the importance of digital media being just as important as paper and print, where either can dumb you down or either can, can heighten your intelligence. Say more about that. What do you, what do you think? I mean, that's, that's his point. But right. Uh, you know, how do you see that? Yeah. That coming from from a visual arts standpoint, I love that. <laughs> I mean, that's that to me is is what what I do is I, I try to increase the the digital literacy of my kids, not through words, through visual images, um, and sometimes too much on one side. Sometimes I don't connect enough to um, to to words. You know, I and I know I'm critical of that, and I, I wish there was there was better collaboration between the two. You know. And I think uh, he made a point in the book also about the connection between, um, you know, he gave an example of like a, a chemistry student learning art through chemistry and in creating both, you know, a chemistry project learning about the metal that they were working with and in that connection. And I don't think that happens, it certainly doesn't happen anywhere in the secondary level right now, regardless of whether it's on text or not. So, I, and if it does elsewhere, please let me know. I, I think it's fantastic if it did, but it, it's certainly not in my level. So that, that's that's the point of the affinity spaces and 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 experience and so forth again, or and mixing of of disciplines or. Well, I think there's a lot of points about the affinity spaces, like, um, you know, that different people can enter at different places and, and you can be an expert um, without credentials and, that, um, you know, they're passion-driven places. Uh, he, he mentions a number of things that he likes about affinity spaces. There's like 20 points that um, are worth looking at and applying to schools. Um, I mean, I could think of one. Go ahead. Do a couple. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, like, um, if it, here's something from about page 175-ish. Affinity spaces take a proactive stance on learning. It's always good to ask for help. Never all right not to be a proactive agent managing one's own learning. Everyone has an obligation to facilitate the learning of others. You know, so there's this whole idea of mentorship and informal mm -hmm. mentorship and um, different roles that people can assume easily, whereas in, you know, you contrast that with schooling and, you know, the, there aren't as many easy entry points. And that's just one of his points. I, I actually have kind of an interesting anecdote that illustrates what you just said. Um, I, I was teaching um, a course, um, it was on William Blake, who's this British Romantic poet, and um, I required all of my students to bring laptops to class every day, um, and we tweeted often, as a, we had like a Twitter back channel. Um, but at one point, uh, I, I 
yeah. one of the students had some question, uh, or we were doing some we were doing some kind of activity in class, and a student asked this you know sort of simple like question about Blake that you could find on Wikipedia, and I looked at him and I said, well, you have a computer, don't you? Why don't you look it up? And he was like, oh, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> and it was, just, it was just sort of this interesting kind of moment where traditional, the traditional teacher would, of course, answer that question because they're the expert. But to model a different kind of learning creates these kind of weird moments where, where you don't, you're kind of in between, right? You don't know how to act as a student or as a teacher. You know, do you just say it or do you encourage them to, to sort of, you know, figure it out on their own. So, coming coming back to this whole idea of affinity spaces, um, <clears throat> that part of the book definitely reminded me um, of Clay Shirky's book, "Here Comes Everybody," um, which I feel like really kind of, and I probably read it later than everybody else, but it it, it marked a really important kind of shift in my head about social media, which I, up to that point, had been kind of averse to. Um, <clears throat> and I liked, you know, I mean, all the stuff he does with the grandmother who makes the purple potty on Sims and, um, you know, his stories about that, stuff like that really are a lot like the Clay Shirky stories about how, how many, I don't know how many people have, have are familiar with this book. I assume that lots of people have read it, but then sometimes I'm wrong. Do you guys know this book? I do. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> Some of us. Okay, uh, but but Shirky just tells like story after story to kind of layer on this idea that that the way that we think has changed and the way that we're going to continue to solve problems is going to change and um, and when G was making those kinds of um, when when he was kind of going in those kind of vectors, I I liked it. I wanted I guess I wanted to see him do more with that. I thought that um, that I that at some points it it stayed inside of a level of abstraction that that didn't that didn't get down to like nitty gritty examples enough. Like when he got to the example of the grandmother and the Sims story and all of that. Like I just wanted more and more and more of that. Um, or, or more, or even better, like classroom, you know, applications of things like that. Because I, f I feel like all of these books, like this book and the Rheingold um, Net Smart book and the Kathy Davidson book, and there's another one in English that relates to rhetoric by uh, Colin Brook, um, Lingua Fracta. Um, all these books that are kind of chewing over. Uh, digital pedagogy and the implications of digital culture on education. Um, what they're doing really to me that I like is is they're suggesting this kind of vast epistemological change um, in knowledge production. Um, and so when he was doing that, I was really jazzed. Like that, but at the same time, I was also aware of the fact that I might be falling prey to the kinds of thinking that he talks about in the beginning of the book where he's like sometimes we just you know call sources that prove what we have a suspicion is true already um, so that kind of like thing that he did in the beginning that makes you doubt the way that you think um, I you know kind of like stayed with me for the remainder of the book but um, but yeah, those are just. I think the affinity, com the, the affinity community stuff was um, were, was probably the the most valuable part of the book for me. I, I, I want to call out Marcy if I could for a second <laughs> and just say what what you've been thinking as we've been talking, and then <laughs> if you'd like to. <laughs> sure. Sure. <laughs> Um, I just, I, I guess I have the international perspective. Um, I don't live in the United States. I do live on a border community. So when you were talking about how the book talks a lot about American politics, I was thinking I'd better brush up because um, I'm not overly familiar with those. But I think that the book speaks to a lot of the challenges that um, certainly we've been having discussions about in our school and 
the value of literature in the 21st century curriculum um, is something that I know the English department in the upper school has been definitely um, having a lot of conversations and having the um, students do a lot of blogging around and um, talking about what they feel about the purpose of writing and the purpose of literature in the 21st century. So I'm excited to get my copy of the book and be able to um, read it and think about how um, it's going to apply in my classroom and things that I'll be able to do with it. Mm -hmm. Marcy, where, where are you again? I missed that part. Where are you? I don't know if she heard me. I don't know. Marcy, where, where, where is your school? Where, where do you live? I live in St. Catharines, Ontario, which is near Niagara Falls. Okay. But I teach at an international boarding school. We have students from 36 countries around the world. Um, he kind of talks about um, when you said, you know, what's the role of literature and, and that. Um, he makes this thing um, in Chapter 19, which I like. Um, in the U.S. right now, there's a big focus on STEM education. You know, we've got to get more engineers. We need more mathematicians and that, which is great. Um, but I think um, he does a nice job of saying that we need both. Um, you know, we need the STEM people and we need the liberal arts people, and we actually need both everybody to know both or a little bit more about those. And so he talks about, you know, uh, without going into too much detail, he talks about the empirical game, which is kind of like finding evidence to back up your arguments, you know, and, and being open to evidence that dispute our arguments that. Um, Pete was just talking about, you know, being open to that. So there's this kind of science tradition that we need to foster in schools, which is definitely, you know, got a lot of steam in our STEM right now. But um, the uh, the other thing he says is, um, but we also need this, the question of the mind vision game, and he says it's the question where, you know, you imagine yourself, um, the world talking to you and saying, what do you think we should do like the individual is thinking like what the world is asking of the individual so you've got on the one hand the science game the empirical game where you're um, talking about uh, backing up your facts and the other thing is more like the domain of the liberal arts and he says uh, the liberal arts are fundamentally about envisioning better worlds and selves and so I, I really like his point that you can't do one without the other that if you're only going to do STEM, you're, you're missing out on this whole big question that we've been asking for centuries, uh, and that is, you know, how do we make this place a better world? And, and the other thing is, like, well, the liberal arts need STEM, though, too, because we need to find those answers where possible. So I thought that was pretty cool. I think that's a really good point. I mean, um, if you look at the history, actually, of um, science as a discipline, Right, um, it doesn't even it isn't even really called science until the middle of the 19th century, and a lot of the reasons why it's called science is actually called natural philosophy. Right, um, the, a lot of the reasons why it was called science was due to professionalization, the emergence of sort of professional scientists in the 19th century. If you look at uh, a lot of the scientists from the early you know 19th century, Humphrey Davy, who did a lot of experiments with nitrous oxide and 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 oxygen. For example, uh, Erasmus Darwin, who is the um, grandfather of Charles Darwin, they actually wrote poetry. Like they and and they did a lot of things that were, you know, considered today to be very different from what scientists do. Um, and so you could make a very compelling argument that this that this you know division that we see between the sciences and the arts um, is really sort of a product of the very industrial culture that you know, I think digital technology is kind of slowly doing away with, so. I think one of the interesting things about that argument and, or, or that point, and especially with um, when you talk about the, 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 the digital access to those two fields, um, when you look at the STEM, and we have this discussion all the time when, when we get into pedagogy and, and curriculum, um, there's such a, such a basis of 
absolute truths in those fields. You know, there there are things that can't be rebutted. You know, two plus two equals four, and we know that. And and you know, we, science with the the you know all the elements and things like that. And and uh, when you get into the liberal arts and and the fine arts and all the other things, you you suddenly lose the stone curriculum basis that everything's built upon that that kind of dissipates because what is art you know is, is this good art or is this bad art well there's no concrete answer is is this was this a great novel that changed history or was it not you know you're always going to find people to argue those two things so i think you're right i think you I think you do have to balance those two but i think that's why people find those two so interesting and why people sometimes double dip in the two is because you can go from something that has such a concrete basis to something that really has very little fundamentals and leaves very open conversation about those things lee do you want yeah, to yeah i want to jump in i want to okay. pop back actually to something Roger said a while back, and that connects to something we had talked about earlier. You were talking about that moment in your classroom when you told the student, essentially, just Google it, look, look mm -hmm. it up, right? And so we're, we're in the type of work that, that we do, and in our program, working within an institution, we're trying to push those boundaries. We're trying to create um, a space to push against some of these norms. And that's uncomfortable for our students, too. I mean, they, they know that they want that to be the ideal, and we know that that's the ideal, but, but just reconfiguring how that operates, I, I think, is, is a challenge for us as, as higher educators as well. I was reading, you know, as we were talking about the affinity spaces, going back through one of his, where he's talking about these, these spaces, there's no great inflation, dumbing down, multiple routes to mastery for those who seek it and we are genuinely trying to do that within these bounds of that institution that we're, we're pushing against and the, the institution isn't necessarily pushing back against us for doing it we're, we're supported in doing that our challenge really has been um, in, in, in helping our students relearn how to operate in, in those existing environments and so that that's where I see our greatest challenge is that is that piece is sort of how do we all operate like you said Roger together like we're we're relearning this piece what does that what does that look like and that that's sort of um, something that I constantly think about how can I better better do that better facilitate that better create this can you create your own affinity space you know is that is that a possibility yeah I, I really identify with what you just said Lee because um... Actually, I have another anecdote from my fiance who's trying to teach a lot of these digital literacies to her freshmen. Um, and in her evaluation, one of the students said, um, you know, she had them do uh, sort of mini TED Talks, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of based upon the rhetoric of the, of the TED Talk. And um, one of the students actually said, you know, I, I don't want to give a speech on, on a topic. I want to be able to write an essay when my, when my employer asks me for it. Exactly. And, yeah. and, my, and my fiance was like, what? Right. How, that, like that kind of, I mean, I think we're dealing, and, I, and a lot of the freshmen in our, in, at Washington State, you know, are, have been brought up on no child left behind, and so they think in those ways, and it's really hard to sort of break through that layer of, yeah. you know. What is that know. way of thinking, though, specifically? You mean? Like there's a right and a wrong test. answer. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a standardized test mentality, and we find a lot of our, our beginning activities in, in scaffolding our own students, we spend a lot of time sort of deleting that layer, like setting them, purposely making them fail. Because knowing that that's okay, I mean, to break through those things, to actually even get to the core of some of the things that, that he's talking about there in these ideal spaces that we, we want to create. Um, so it's, it's been a, a, a bit of a challenge. And, and there's been, at first there's pushback, as you were saying, from like your fiancé students. Like, I don't, I don't want this. Why are you making me do X, Y, and Z? There's, there is that pushback. And then you just have to push back a little bit further. To, to open that gate up before you can sort of, of get to there. So I don't know if I'm being ideal of thinking that people would want to 
would come with that mentality already, but it seems like that's a, a layer that, the, a challenge that we have too. And again, yes, we're working within institutions that are already have these, you know, cogs or whatever you want to call them, machines that are, are running, but I feel that I have a lot of, of liberty and, and is supported that way. It's more sometimes the actual classroom environment where some of those tensions arise, not necessarily from the institution now. So, Roger, just to help me, um, so what is your fiancé going to do? Um, less type talk next time or, you know, I mean, because we want to listen to students and their needs too, right, and what their expectations are? Um, I like, think it, I, what's what's the point of that story? In some well, I don't I don't think it's a question mm -hmm. about expectations. It's a question of um, mm -hmm. getting our students to where they need to be, right? And resetting their notions of what what kind of job market is out there, and what, what kind of literacies they need to succeed in you know in the world, both as both as um, workers mm -hmm. and as citizens, you know, um, and that's difficult. Like. You know, I think one of the big anxieties our students have is that they're living in, in a culture where um, they have to give the right answer, and that's the only way that they can get to where they think they're going, right? They think that the world is about somebody giving them a question and them giving the right answer, and that's not the world that, that you know, this, this sort of new world that a lot of us are seeing emerging in front of us. That's not the world that's there. So. It's it's like like um, like we said it's a, it's like a sort of a layer it's like this weird shell that they have in front of them. This weird shell that they have in front of them. Um, and it's and it's really I I think it's really about breaking through that in some way. I don't know that I have a I don't know that I have a, like an answer as to what the best no, way to do that is. No, think but. where you were going with that. Yeah. Peter, Pete, you wanted to say something, it looks like. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yep. Yeah, can you can you hear me okay now? Yeah, go okay. ahead. Yeah. yeah, I think that um, I, I missed a little piece because my connection dropped out, but um, but this relates to something that Lee was saying and what Roger was saying. I, I think f for me, all, all of these questions come back to the discipline of critical pedagogy and the fact that uh, I mean, whether it's digital or whether it's literature or whether it's driver's ed or whether it's taekwondo or whatever, that um, that we have um, to a greater a greater or lesser degree institutions that are interested in promoting certain ideas, and we have people to a greater or lesser degree who are interested in learning certain things, and that we find ourselves constantly kind of in the in the middle space of those two motivations. Um, and for me, the, the challenge of being, being involved in you know, having a kind of critical pedagogical orientation is that, um, is that you, you study really hard what that institution is doing and why it is doing it. Um, and I think that it's very true. I mean, this is certainly true for Roger and Leanne and I when we were teaching at Georgia Tech. Um, that students are coming out of an institutional system and, and those students, um, and probably lots of students other places too, have been institutionalized, like, like very rigidly institutionalized. And to, to break away from the, the right answer grade and the quizzes, uh, make sure that you turn every single um, thing in with all of the formatting points correct, um, to, to, to do all of that, uh, to, to break out of that and to challenge people, like, like Lee was saying, to fail and to give students the opportunity to play with something um, is, is, so, is only foreign to, to students, I think, because the institution has just, um, has just beaten, out, beaten that impulse out of them. Um, and I grades go right along with that, and so I like forestall and, and and avoid discussions of grades after the first day of class for so long, painfully long, um, to try to and, and deflect them. Like I do this like rhetorical judo for like the first month of the semester, so that so that we just don't think about grades anymore. And there's there's always this time around about like the last third 
of the semester where somebody goes, you know, we really haven't talked about grades very much. And I'm like, okay, well, the, you know, like this part of the semester is a success because you've been really busy doing a lot of things. And they have not been in an effort to accumulate a whole bunch of, um, you know, chips or points or, you know, whatever the hell somebody wants to say um, is something that matters. Um, and again, like, that's the institution, that's, that's institutional learning systems that, that do that to us. Um, and, and it is not, um, it is not in our, or our best, or our students' best interest to just take that direction, um, to, to swallow that direction, like, Kool-Aid, and I mean, he, he, G is talking about that in the book, too, um, that, so it, that we should be thinking more broadly than that. Is, is that the anti-education era that he's talking about, then, that institutional era? Did I disagree? I don't know. I don't know if somebody else should answer that question, because I feel like I just talked a whole bunch. <laughs> No, I was just trying to get back to the title a little bit and back to the book as we no, just trying to get begin back to wrap up. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just to be totally transparent. <laughs> so, any thoughts about the book? I, we I, seem to be I breaking guess, up here and there, but you're good. I guess I kind of see that title operating in a sense that. Um, we're kind of in a in a moment in history where we're in between two systems of of how we understand the world, right? If you think about um, the past, you know, since the spread of the printing press, right? <laughs> um, you know, we've had institutions and um, uh, po you know politics and organizations that have been supported by a communication system that's largely based upon print. Um, and that is changing now. And so it means that a lot of our institutions aren't built to, to deal with the reality that's confronting us. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times, you know, and this happens in my class, like I, I will just do something I'll experiment with something, and it's good to be experimental just in general, I guess, but like sometimes I don't even really know what the pedagogical value is of what I'm doing, right? I don't, I don't know it until I've done it. Um, and so I think anti-education era might relate to the fact that it, on several different levels in our culture and in our society, we don't really know what we're doing. We don't really know the best way to, 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 to deal with each other online. Right? We don't really know how to organize our politics so that it can be democratic. You know, because, because things are changing so quickly in front of us. Um, and so we have to invent those things. That's my take anyway. Good. Thank you. Um, why don't we make um, a round of last sort of thoughts. And one thought I had about that is to say, like, um, I don't know. What do you hope we we hit when when um, when G's with us? <laughs> um, and just to make it go fast, Chris, do you want to go first? <laughs> sure. Um, I guess you know what he lays out is that we've got some big problems um, that we need to deal with at the social level, um, and that the anti-education era for me are the many things we do to either avoid that or to do find the wrong answers to these big problems that we have. And so, I mean, the thing that I want him to talk more about is the little quote from the beginning pages, um, you know, when he talks about what's smart about this book isn't me, it's really, you know, me plugging and plugging myself into good tools and um, mm -hmm. other people in right ways. And if we do that, then we can be smart and moral and we can save the world. And so that's what, as a classroom teacher, I want to kind of unpack a little bit how we go about doing that. Jerry, what do you wish you had asked him? Uh, you know, it's funny. I got to say first, um, I think you get a kick out of the fact that we 
uh, just spent that much time discussing the title because um, it's not the original title, but I'm not going to ruin it for you. You have to ask him what the original title was, and okay. uh, I, I think you'll get a big kick out of that. You know, you know, I think the question that I want to ask him, um, and this goes along with everything you just said, I wholeheartedly agree with you know with everything Pete you were saying there, and and um, I, I I like all that. The question is, who folds first? Where does the change come from? Does the change come from a higher university level first and then trickle down into, you know, and Roger, you just said the change is happening around us so quickly, and, and I agree with that. Those changes are life, but our uh, our education system is such a dinosaur, at least where I am. It, it moves so slowly that who who's going to initiate these changes first? Do they come from, from, from down low? Do they come from you know, from the top. And that's one of the things we discussed on the podcast with him, which is on the website, there's a shameless plug. If you want to check it out uh, later this week. And, uh, you know, I asked him who was doing it right, whose educational system was, was aimed right. If, if ours was not going very well. And he had some interesting thoughts on that, but that ended up in like a 40 minute discussion. So, so Jerry, wh when are you guys live? Uh, you know, we actually, re we recorded him, um, no, but generally, yes, when are you so, guys on? Oh, th that show will post. Uh, we post every Saturday. Thursday nights, we're we're, we're switching into a format which is now our um, Thursday night live hangouts. But um, for your, for we this Jim was actually on for our hundred hundred and first episode, um, which which was a recorded podcast. Which we thanks, which will be uh, Saturday night. And thank you, by the way, for having me on. This is this has been a okay. fantastic time too. So so you record on Thursday at what time? Um, you know, we, we've been fl flopping around a little bit, but I think it's going to be like 8 p.m. I think that's what we're sticking with now. Eastern. Um, no, that's Central. I'm sorry. So that's 9 p.m. Okay. Good. Great. Lee, any last well, thoughts? I'm interested to hear what the original title was because as just to <laughs> wrapping up our conversation in terms of the anti-education piece, the, these affinity spaces can't be credentialed. So I would, I would love to hear if, if he had any undertones to that there, and I think that's where some of the rub happens. We're looking for a credential, we're looking for a grade, and, and that's what the workplace wanted. So I'd, I'd love to hear more of his, um, his thoughts on that, and if, if that were, were any of his, his undertones and, and thoughts as he, as he went through this, because I think that's where a lot of those tensions come in, that you can't put something, a stamp on this, and, and that's what we, we've been grown up with stamps and diplomas and things like that. So I'd, I'd be interested to, to hear his thoughts from, from that point of view. Marcy, thank you for joining us. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I could just watch and not actually be oh. in the Google Hangout. I'm I'm glad I'm I'm glad you didn't know that. Go. So, uh, sorry. <laughs> no, um, don't be sorry. We're glad to have you here. <laughs> I guess it's a typical Canadian thing to do is just to apologize. Oh. Um, <laughs> so I guess I'm just I want to have a better understanding of, you know the what he's written behind the book and um, I'm a very auditory learner so just reading it isn't going to give me the same as actually hearing him speak about it and um, kind of dive into some of the topics that people have found really interesting so that's what I'm looking to get out of it. And I, I want to say that I love that you guys have pointed out the affinity spaces and I'll uh, key in on that um, as I'm reading it um, and, and one, one of the things that, that I really worry about is that if I'm ever back in a classroom where there aren't computers, I'm not going to know what to do. Like when I'm outside at, at, at uh, you know, uh, uh, in a park observing birds or doing whatever with kids, I'm cool. I don't have to have computers. I don't want to say that. But I, I never want to be the source of information <laughs> anymore. Um, so that that's uh, one of the thoughts that I've been having recently. Like, I don't. I don't know how to teach that one anymore. I only know how to teach when the source of information is out there, and we're working on that together. So that's just one of my thoughts here. Pete, do you have any final thoughts? Thank you for joining us, by the way. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It's been an interesting conversation. Um, I, I guess I would want to. I would want to just argue a bunch of little points with him. Um, just because in the beginning I, I, um, some of his rhetoric just was kind of like rubbing me the wrong way. And so I was like, I was almost motivated to 
to like keep keep reading because I was bothered by you know like this conservative liberal binary that he was throwing out there and um, but I guess the thing that I would want to um, know the most is so when when we talk about these things like collaboration and collective thinking and um, and you know what do what do you think is best for us all all of this kind of um, all these approaches uh, in all of these books there's kind of an underpinning of you know we need to move in this direction because this is where the world is going either because whatever people say that the job market is going going that way or the world in general is going that way but his book interrogates the idea that that the thing that you think is true really is true uh, because it's this his or empirically true or it's just true in your head because you want it to be true because you want that kind of meaning to be there um, and so the question I would want to ask him is um, and it is really hard is can you prove that this way that we all kind of want the world to be or we want our classroom to be more like can you prove that there is you know that, that this is really valuable that this is um, that there is a shift in this direction, that it's not just a bunch of people talking about how great it would be if there were this shift. Um, I, I, I found it really interesting how much he wanted to go back and talk about science and data and numbers and how, how people are normally not really compelled by that stuff. And so I wanted to fold that argument back on his kind of larger argument about what we should all be doing. Like, can you prove that the, that's what we should all be doing, you know? That sounds like a good challenge. Roger, thank you. I don't know Roger. if that makes any sense or not, but... <laughs> no, it does. Roger, any final thoughts? You started yeah, I... this, but... You go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, I'm just going to... I just want to reflect what... or sort of expand upon what Jerry said, you know, this question of where change comes from, um, to sort of think about maybe the political issues that are involved, right? Like, there's so many people... I mean, we're talking about changing literally an entire institution, and how does that, how does that happen? How does that happen in an intentional way, and how does that happen in a way um, so that, you know, those of us in traditional um, fields like the humanities or like English um, that really value what we do, um, how does that happen so that we don't lose sort of our core, core values, um, which I see sometimes, I see, you know, the whole MOOC mania stuff sort of running into a kind of, um, you know, a very sort of corporate kind of job focused notion of what education should be. And I'm not sure that that's all that it should be. So. Well, thank you. Um, lots of, lots of thoughts here again. I, the, the MOOC mania stuff I, gives me the excuse to say that I, I love that we're small. Um, <laughs> and we invite just a, six people to come talk to us. Um, <laughs> and we do that every Wednesday night here on Teacher Station Teachers. Um, uh, so we invite you back um, next Wednesday. Next Wednesday, we're actually going to be talking to um, Steve Zemmelman and um, Andrea uh, from Michigan. What's her name, Andrea? Um, I forgot her name. Suddenly, Andrew, I forget. She's, I think she's anyway. But we're going to be talking about um, raising teacher voice and and thinking about um, what happens when um, when teachers do start to raise their voices about big issues, um, political issues, and so forth in, in their classrooms. So um, and then the week after that, um, James Paul G will be with us and we'll continue this conversation. So. Come back any Wednesday, and uh, we'll be here. Um, and we are broadcasting over the EdTech Talk um, channel of the World Bridges Network. And we thank Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo for setting all that up. And Dave Cormier, thank you for MOOCs. Never mind. <laughs> That's just a little joke there. Um, but th thank you all for stopping by. Talk to you soon. Thank you.